Um, I'm very pleased to pass the word now over to our speaker today, uh, Victor Kipiani from Geocase. Please, Victor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vambling. Thank you for your warm welcome and thank you for your generous introduction. Uh, I'm really very much delighted to, to present some of my points on the Georgia's path since regaining its independence. And of course, special thanks go to Russia and Caucasus Regional Research Platform at Malmö University. So thank you for having me. It's really a privilege and it's really good opportunity as well. I was thinking um, in which way to make my presentation and frankly speaking, although we call it presentation, but I would rather invite all of us to reflect rather than to preach, advocate, jumping to conclusions, et cetera, et cetera, because uh, 30 years, uh, it's not a, a small span of time but same time, it's not as big sometimes to, to make a definitive conclusion on, on all the points, especially in the world, which is up appending our eyes. And we're chattering an unknown lens in terms of geopolitics, regional, geoeconomics, et cetera, et cetera, nation building. And frankly speaking, uh, I would, I would rather uh, not, uh, uh, I would not, not treat myself to, uh, to speak, you know, in a, in a way as to have a sort of, you know, certainty in my, in my views and my points. So therefore I think that the reflection, reflections are well suited, you know, for our discussions. And I also thought that uh, how to structure my uh, reflections, as I've said, and um, I would try to go along uh, the following lines. Georgia's posture internationally and Georgia's posture regionally. And the uh, last but not uh, least important uh, section of my reflections, as I've said, would be domestic matters. And then I thought that dividing those domestic pillar into two sub pillars, which is on political resilience of Georgian political system and or the resilience and sustainability of Georgian economy. I think that all in all, this structure would hopefully give all, all of us, you know, a good feedback for our follow-up thoughts and follow-up reflections. So let me start please with, uh, with uh, international uh, posture. Uh, uh, which is uh, which is premised on uh, both opportunities and challenges. I think that those challenges, I'm pretty sure those challenges are not uh, new to, to, to any one of you. We're facing dramatic changes in the region. We're right on the eve of uh, hopefully, uh, I, I very much hope and fingers crossed that a major escalation would be avoided but there are big, big question marks. And uh, the reality is that we are placed in the center of those geopolitical gravitation. And therefore what we are to expect in the, in the, in the coming days would have direct implicit bearing on Georgian matters, on Georgian political institutions and Georgian resilience. Uh, but if, if you ask me when we speak about Georgian foreign policy, what those priorities in foreign policy and international politics of Georgia are, I would rather say in a probably less legalist way and less diplomatic way, but more in a fictional manner, if you will. It's about getting closer to Europe and getting closer to your Atlantic community. And when I'm saying getting close and picking up, you know, those connotations very cautiously because each of those paths, each of those way could be implemented or should be implemented on a very, in a very responsible manner. Uh, and realizing that the process is always about a two way street. It's not just moving from our side. It's also how the Euro and your Atlantic community reacts to Georgia's matters, appreciates 
the challenges on our side and feels all the pain which we feel. And this is very important and I would rather emphasize because sometimes, you know, when we speak about a success of Georgia's reforms and Georgia's aspirations, that success story is all inclusive. It's all about us. It's not just about Georgians making a success. It's also a litmus test, if you will, for the European community, how receptive they are, how perceptive they are, and how knowledgeable they are of the region, and especially of a small nation, which is Georgian nation, which is in very volatile region, faced with many turbulences and many, many, equally as I've said, opportunities and challenges. So therefore, I think, you know, getting closer is the most, you know, responsible manner on conveying my own interpretation of Georgian foreign policies. Same time, when we speak about a, the biggest challenge on both ways of getting, of the so-called getting closer, of course, you know, it is, the occupation, the occupation at this stage, you know, remains the greatest challenge. And when we speak about the occupation, I would uh, uh, respectfully draw your attention to uh, sometimes, you know, not uh, uh, to a very frequent misunderstanding, which we Georgians come across when reading uh, Western media, uh, when uh, 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 reading articles by Western pundits and scholars. Uh, the, the mistake and the misunderstanding is about speaking about ethnic politics in Georgia and ethnic conflicts. I should necessarily point out that, of course, you know, Georgian Apatian and Georgian Ossetian uh, conflicts, uh, by definition, they have all the characteristics of the ethnic conflicts, but essentially, profoundly, conceptually, it's not about ethnopolitics, but it's about geopolitics. Because eruption of those conflicts in Georgia was a direct response and is continuing to be direct response, a destructive response, to Georgia's foreign policy objectives. So this is very important for us because when we speak about ethnic conflicts, of course, again, with all my appreciation for the ethnicity of those conflicts, we're sort of, you know, recalibrating the essence of the problems in a wrong way. This is, this is you know, my, my perception and, and my suggestion and my kind sort of, you know, uh, respectful advice. Uh, since I've mentioned getting closer, of course, we realize that um, on that way, being a reliable partner is very important. And that reliability uh, requires from us an effective foreign policy and effective domestic policy. Again, when we speak about effective Georgian foreign policy, effectiveness also, you know, opposes a big question mark what are the limits of those effectiveness? And where those limits are, uh, when stepping beyond those limits, you know, the situation could spiral out and we could come across, you know, on uh, uh, extra challenges, extra pressure and, and, and extra troubles. So I think that effectiveness and responsibility of handling those foreign policy is very much in line with each other. Um, on the way of our integration with your Atlantic community, I should necessarily sum up very quickly those very important uh, platforms or instruments which Georgia, uh, Georgia enjoys and possesses. Those are in the first instance, Georgia's NATO cooperation. As uh, most of you uh, know, Georgia is an active contributor to the NATO-led order uh, and peacekeeping operations. This is very important. We're not just a consumer of your Atlantic order. And this is something which I want to emphasize very 
very strongly as a Georgian. We're not consuming the Euro Atlantic water, but we're contributing the Euro Atlantic water. And sometimes we're contributing beyond the limits of our capabilities and resources. So that is very important for us to note. It is also very important to note that the, our cooperation with NATO is not just about peace-leading operation or peacekeeping operation. It's about a changing uh, a reality of uh, uh, in a Georgian defense and defense-related industries. And those uh, leverages are, in the first place, uh, it's a NATO Georgian commission, which oversights implementation of reforms in Georgian security and defense. It's also uh, Georgia getting a status of the enhanced opportunities partner since 2014. And we all very much look forward to NATO 2030 uh, strategic vision, which should focus more intensively on the role and on the meaning of the Black Sea in the overall context of the Eurasian security. So I think, you know, this is the pass in front of us and we all, our NATO partners and Georgian, Georgians should, you know, tackle uh, this mission and that, that agenda in a, in, a, in, a most, in a most appropriate way. The second, uh, uh, the second uh, the, the platform or the second uh, leverage, it's about Georgia and European Union. Again, to sum up, you know, some basic facts, which uh, we all know, but uh, for the sake of good uh, order, uh, we should necessarily point out to them. And those key pillars of the partnership of Georgia's partnership with the European Union are association agreements and uh, uh, deep compre comprehensive and free trade agreements. Those are, if, if I can say, you know, the constitutional documents of Georgia's getting closer to Europe, as I've said at the very beginning of my uh, uh, sort of a reflexive presentation. Also, um, I should necessarily mention that we've joined uh, various other uh, important uh, legal documents, uh, such as European Energy Community Treaty, and as you could appreciate, you know, being in the region um, uh, of, uh, of the small land of uh, patch of land between the Black Sea and the Caspian region, but the patch of land which is, um, uh, which is uh, uh, sort of, you know, the, the, which, which positions itself with many, uh, with a number of important infrastructure and energy cross-border projects, joining uh, energy community treaty has been an important step in harmonizing a rules of game on the Georgian side with internationally recognized norms and standards. It's also about visa-free regime, and it's also about Eastern partnership. But I would stop you now for a second on Eastern partnership with your permission. Uh, with appreciation of the, uh, of the uh, controversy, on my side, uh, but for the sake of honesty, in my reflections, I should necessarily say that um, although welcoming the Eastern partnership, partnership, we should admit that this combination uh, seems to me a bit uh, non-organic, if you will, because if you remember, if you recall that uh, um, six members, uh, six uh, nations, uh, member nations of the Eastern Partnership, although Belarus has suspended uh, relatively recently its membership, are uh, Georgia, Ukraine, uh, Moldova, uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Belarus. You would recognize, uh, uh, recognize instantaneously that, uh, you know, the, the, the frequency and ambition, ambitions of all those six nations are different. And they pursue different uh, uh, speed, uh, uh, frequency, in terms of uh, 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 approximating with Europe. Uh, and therefore, when uh, recently uh, uh, the so-called associated trio has been set up, with uh, uh, with Moldova, Ukraine, and Georgia being uh, members of the trio, I personally welcome you know that step as a more rightful, more sound and more pragmatic. Uh, because it, it, again, you know, uh, uh, with all my respect to all the benefits of the Eastern partnership, 
I think that's a, a clear division between Moldova, Ukraine, and Georgia on one side, and Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Belarus on another side are so clear that they nearly become indisputable. So I think, you know, this is a very positive step, and I very much hope that uh, starting up an associated trio would speed up, speed up to the largest extent possible integrating with the political Europe. Uh, uh, last but not least, uh, are very ambitious, I recognize very ambitious statement by Georgian politicians to officially submit your membership application in 2024. Just setting aside, you know, how well-founded, you know, that statement is. And I very much appreciate all the pros and cons. Still, you know, I personally welcome because an incentive to be more focused on making uh, the Georgian political system as sound as possible, I think is the step in the right direction. So regardless whether that application would be filed or not, and definitely, you know, I have nothing against, you know, that application, at least, you know, it would have an immediate benefit of having an extra pressure an extra healthy pressure on Georgian politics, at least, you know, fingers crossed. And I think that that type of statement will be welcomed, you know, from very pragmatic and very rational standpoint. And the last, uh, the last uh, the intervention, uh, the last uh, sort of, you know, the um, subsection in, uh, the, in, in, in my international coverage, it's about Georgia's United States relationships. And I should single out United States because uh, the United States has been a, a stronger supporter for Georgian sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity for all those 30 years. And uh, honestly, on my personal level, if not that support and not that uh, assistance in many possible respects, it would be very hard to imagine, even to imagine where we would be at this point and this stage of the history. And when we speak about the special meaning and strategic meaning of our uh, partnership with the United States, it's about various fundamental uh, legal acts of, uh, upon which you know that partnership is hinged. It's a Georgia Support Act, Consolidated Appropriation Act, and also it's about the, the so-called the Constitution of Georgia United States strategic partnership. It's the strategic charter, strategic cooperation charter. So I think that the, those uh, uh, issues were uh, in, in relation to sort of, you know, giving you uh, a feeling uh, of the way we, uh, we have covered and of, 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 of the issues, of the challenges and of the opportunities we would be facing from now on. I would uh, 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 stop, stop for, a, for a while on regional posture. And this is very important. South Caucasus and the modern structure of relationships between the countries of the South Caucasus and various regional actors, uh, those relations have really evolved over the years. And they have progressed from the bilateral relations to a more complex and multi-layered system. And ma many pundits and politicians, uh, and I agree with them, see the parallels uh, as well between reg regional context of the uh, regional politics, I would say, and the emerging new, wo uh, new world order. And I, I personally very much concur and share you know, those observations. It is also uh, important to say that uh, uh, very basic, modest, an honest view when we give when we give an analysis about to the South Caucasus uh, compels uh, me to say that the importance of order and stability in the South Caucasus goes beyond the region itself, and uh, and that's uh, importance that the Caucasus is much bigger than just the ge Caucasian geography. It's because of the fact that the Caucasian diversity 
it's truly creator of a system picture of the Eurasian uh, security and Eurasian multicultural system. So that is also very important. I would also uh, uh, say that um, when we speak about the Caucasus, it's, um, it's really painful to realize that still there is not a, enough understanding and knowledge on the Western side about the regional politics. And that ambivalence uh, to pick up, you know, this word diplomatically and very cautiously, that, uh, that ambivalence has been also introduced in this confrontation between the East of the, and the West, the confrontation with, which we see these days on the Ukrainian example, especially with regard to specific countries. Uh, when those countries are uh, named as buffer states, uh, geopolitically no man's lands, or other very amorphous phrase at least. And I think, you know, you know those connotations, those, that, that ambiguity uh, is precisely because of, 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 having, uh, of not having enough understanding, as I've said, among Western politicians and Western political institutions. So this is the voice uh, by a Georgian that a deeper insight and deeper understanding and deeper uh, uh, study of all the implications of regional politics and regional politics in the South Caucasus is the must to understand the wider picture of the Great Black Sea and the wider picture of the Eurasian security. Uh, I already mentioned uh, uh, all the perils, I would say, and all the danger of uh, the so-called Georgian ethnic conflicts, such as Georgian occasion and Georgianization. And once again, my respectful appeal to my colleagues, you know, would be to think twice before they name those conflicts as a purely ethnic conflicts. So all in all, uh, of course, you know, the regional politics of the South Caucasus, it's a big topic. It's a massively big topic. And um, uh, my um, wishful thinking, if you will, at the end, uh, by, by, by concluding, you know, the, uh, my uh, sort of, you know, reflections on, on, on the South Caucasus is that uh, I very much hope that uh, one nice day, the region, which is these days, unfortunately, is synonymous with war, conflict, and instability should and would turn into the one synonymous with peace, mutual understanding, and development instead. Uh, and when, I mean, this, this is not just the phrase, of course, you know, this phrase has a very specific meaning. Because as I've said, you know, we're facing new order in the South Caucasus, and that new order has especially be, been prompted by the aftermath of the second Nagorno-Karabakh war. And let me just please remind you very briefly, what is the landscape, security and geopolitical landscape in the region? We have Turkey, which got a, a, quite a sizable seat, I would say, and meaningful seat at the, regional, uh, at the, the table of regional politics. And uh, that uh, uh, say and that role of Turkey has especially been increased, um, probably some of you know, by uh, very intensive cooperation and partnership with Azerbaijan. And the uh, recent uh, step, you know, by, by increasing that cooperation has been about signing uh, the so-called Shusha Declaration, which is about defense, and security cooperation between Azerbaijan and, and, uh, and uh, Turkey. And all of a sudden, probably not all of a sudden, but still, you know, we received a formerly NATO member in the, in the, in the geography which Russia is treated, is treating and continuing to treat as its exclusive sphere of influence. So I think that that's, in, 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 in many years to follow, uh, the regional geopolitics would be very much under the impacts of the interaction of those two powers, Russian Federation on one side, which for the last 100 years was, has been indisputable leader, geopolitical leader in the region, 
And this time, you know, uh, in the aftermath of the second Nagorno-Karabakh war, we have a Turkey as, I would not be saying, you know, an equally important uh, player, but the player which has increased its leverage and increased its original say considerably. Um, um, the aftermath of the Second Karabakh War has uh, also resulted uh, into not diminishing the Russian uh, role, but uh, emphasizing the Russian role in the region. And that emphasis has been reflected in the increase of military presence. As you know, uh, uh, Azerbaijan has been the only uh, um, sort of, you know, uh, the ex-Soviet Republic with the, with the conflict in its own territory, where Russian peacekeepers were not present. And one of the very concrete and uh, substantial reflections and results of the second, the second Nagorno-Karabakh war that the Russians, Russians troops under the uh, peacekeeping uh, mandate are nowadays are uh, stationed in Azerbaijan. Of course, you know, it changes the dynamics of the region considerably because we Georgians uh, uh, being under the occupation are facing these days, you know, um, considerable Russian military presence, not just in Armenia, but in Azerbaijan as well. So it has direct impact on the Georgian security politics. Um, uh, we should expect that uh, probably, again, you know, arguably for some, that um, Armenia's defeats in the Second uh, Karabakh War could reduce its outreach to the West. And uh, yeah, last but not least, you know, which I, what I forgot about this um, sort of, you know, a promise of uh, Turkey and, and Russia. And this is really very important that the, uh, the marriage for convenience of Turkey and Russian Federation in the region is uh, incentivized and driven by the ambitious, uh, by, by Turkey and Russia to squeeze out the West from the region. And this is very important. And that takes me to the big, big question mark. Where is the West in the region? And where will the West remain uh, continue to be present in the region in the most meaningful and, and powerful presence, you know. This is the biggest issue, especially for, for us, for Georgians, because as you know, we are, we are the only country which has proclaimed officially that our integration with Europe, our integration with your Atlantic community is the key foreign policy objective. So therefore, the entrenchments or selective engagements or many other, you know, nice names, which um, we could find uh, abundantly in Western media and politics, you know, whereby they, the, West, the, the Western politicians are, are trying to disguise, you know, uh, I would not be saying, you know, negligence, of course, you know, I'm not, not saying, I'm, I'm not speaking about negligence, but at least, you know, some resistance to being, to actively pursue uh, the uh, the uh, the regional politics in the South Caucasus, of course, you know, it's it's very much on our agenda, and it's very much on our concern. So we look forward that in the years to come, you know, that presence would become more powerful, more meaningful, and more substantial. But this is the big big issue, and uh, I appreciate that touching on all the implica implications of, of that issue in uh, in course of these discussions is uh, beyond the limits. Um, uh, so I, I would I would rather conclude at this point, you know, when speaking about Georgia's international posture and Georgia's regional posture. Oh, by the way, when we speak about the Georgia's regional posture, you probably have had about the so-called platform of three plus three, which is uh, which is considered, you know, by Georgia by official policy very cautiously, uh, which. Uh, um, as it was said, you know, stated by the uh, Georgian Georgia's Foreign Office, it's a set of you know disguised attempts by by by, by Russia, uh, Turkey, and Iran to get a better domination and more meaningful domination over the region. We we said that we are not in a position to to join that platform. We're not ready and we're not willing to join that platform 
just because of the reason, I th and I think you know that reason is more than enough that we cannot sit next to uh, Russian Federation and speak about the peace and stability when Georgian territories are remaining under the Russian occupation. So it would be um, extremely the, the unacceptable, and therefore um, um, Georgians have uh, set forth, you know, their own initiative about um, accomplishing stability and order. It's about it's it's called the peaceful uh, neighborhood peaceful initiative, and it's also about bringing Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia over those issues which can unite us, economy-wise or policy-wise. So we'll see. At least you know those are the sort of you know competing regional initiatives, and uh, I was bound you know to mention those regional initiatives because um, the uh, the sustainability of each of those initiatives would have a critical say in the context of regional landscape. Uh, next uh, uh, destination points uh, in my uh, reflections uh, is about the uh, Georgian political system. And I think, you know, this is, this is the part of uh, my, of our uh, discussions, which are, uh, as, as I, uh, Anticipate, you know, uh, are uh, expected, you know, with um, sort of, you know, the, with special interest. Uh, um, some of my conclusions, uh, I realize, would not be shared by by the whole audience, but still, you know, let me place uh, name a uh, few of uh, challenges. Uh, which are typical to Georgia and which are typical to not just Georgia, but typical to transition economies, transition countries, and these days, which are also becoming typical to the developed democracies as well. And uh, the curiosity uh, of my statement that when we speak about Georgia's getting closer to Europe, Unfortunately, it's not just about positive agenda, but it's also about negative agenda when we have to work out a common response and recipe how to deal with challenges such as domestic extremism, polarization, uh, impatience uh, towards uh, hearing and accepting different opinion and, uh, and just, you know, hearing each other and listening to each other and accepting and agreeing with each other. So I think, you know, therefore, you know, this, I would be discussing, you know, the Georgian challenges, but those are not just Georgian challenges by definition, but these are the challenges which we all share to the varying extent. But still, you know, uh, since uh, this uh, webinar is about Georgia, um, I should necessarily say that uh, uh, insufficiency of political culture and standards when winner takes all. This is one of the sort of, you know, the, the negative sides of the Georgian politics. Non-inclusivity, which is also very typical. Zero-sum game, which probably, you know, also relates to the, uh, to the harmful uh, principle of when the winner takes all. Of course, you know, those have very direct, profound, and if you will, you know, the, the philosophical, philosophical impact on the quality of Georgian political life. And uh, if you also take into account uh, uh, of the last years, uh, a low turnout uh, in uh, Georgian elections, uh, what is obvious to me that there is a quest among Georgian voters for new political camps, for new political forces and new political leaders. And when I'm saying new, it's not just about faces, it's about quality, it's about standards, it's about criteria. And if I may say, you know, probably not very modestly that for the last years, when we at GOKs, we advocate for uh, improving quality of Georgian political life, you will never, you, you would never ever come across specific individuals or names because we're speaking about standards. We're speaking about criteria. 
were speaking about approaches, you know, and that is very important because on another side, another downside uh, the, of Georgian politics that it became too much personified, personified, and personified politics, you know, I think, you know, it, that vicious circle, which has to be broken down, you know, for once and ever. Um, these days, uh, especially in Georgian media, you would also hear uh, the complaints about uh, lack of responsible opposition. And lack of responsible opposition, it's not just detrimental for the authorities, but it's also detrimental and reputational damaging for the country. It's also about an absence of compromise and concessions, as well as about politicized and radicalized media. And this is the point, you know, which probably does not single out Georgian media, but that's an overall picture, global picture, which we see nearly everywhere in the world. And the last but not least, and I appreciate, you know, this would be very arguable point, uh, quite a toxic civic sector. And when I speak, you know, about civic sector, I would appreciate and would welcome, you know, non-governmental organizations to become more depoliticized, to be more disconnected from political camps and to handle their activities more responsibly, taking into account not just domestic challenges, but external risks as well. I'm mindful of, of time, but I think that uh, uh, I, should, I should finish you know, in uh, 15 minutes, and then we could have time for Q&A. So uh, a few other points, if, 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 I, if I may. Um, I, I would stop you know, on the elections, and I will stop on the judiciary, because again, I appreciate that those are the uh, topics which uh, where where you would uh, welcome my uh, my my assessments and my my views. So, uh, Georgian elections. Uh, the uh, latest uh, major reforms in Georgian electoral uh, system uh, was made uh, last year. And that reform uh, uh, was uh, has been um, phrased as uh, with enough level a degree of cooperation of the ruling party and uh, several opposition parties. Not all, I should admit, but several opposition parties. But at least you know that been something you know which has been emphasized in in various conclusions and assessments by international bodies. Uh, but. What remains as a challenge uh, is uh, our uh, frequent amendments to the elections law, laws, and those frequent elections, they definitely damaging integrity uh, of the uh, election culture and are not helpful for setting up patterns uh, for the sustainability of that of the culture. Uh, so uh, the key recommendation by international bodies is uh, about making the holistic process, but not micromanaging it from one political cycle to another political cycle. So that is very important. Also very important when I mentioned that although the electoral reform was uh, the, the, has provided for a wider participation of Georgian political spectrum, Still, it was not all inclusive, and therefore, uh, giving the sense of the ownership to all political parties, you know, for any further or any future changes in the elections law would be extremely important. Um, several uh, 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 flaws or errors which still have to be addressed when uh, reforming. Georgian elections, uh, electoral system uh, are about uh, uh, providing with uh, high credentials to non-partisan members of Central Electoral Commission and ensuring diverse membership and merit-based process. This is very important. Also, it is very important that uh, the laws should provide for clear criteria for recounts and annulments. Next, uh, 
major issue which we should tackle on our side is about timely handling election disputes, including submissions, uh, adjudication formalities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, one of those issues which uh, has been argued by the opposition uh, was about equal population size for single mandate electoral districts. And also it's about regulatory for new voting technologies. Uh, probably this is one of the reason which, uh, reasons which, uh, uh, those reasons uh, which led to um, sort of, you know, not sufficiently sustainable uh, level of political pluralism in Georgia. Although I should say that if you look at the Georgian parliaments, uh, it looks like as a dynamic multi-party system. Uh, and it is also important to note that by Georgian laws, it's uh, quite easy in terms of legalese and formalities to, to set up a, a, a political party uh, and operate it without major obstacles. But on another side, and this is the issue which I would raise for my side, that the low entry bar to the Georgian parliament, which is 1%, uh, it provided for, uh, uh, although it provided small parties with uh, good enough chances to get their seats in the parliament, but still it became the cause for political fragmentation and inability to, to form up viable coalitions. So I think that uh, if and when speaking about future uh, uh, changes into the elections law, I think for the sake of sustainability of the political culture, that entry bar should be increased to a reasonable level. Um, uh, I think that we should be proud of that uh, there are no legal restrictions on a gender basis, ethnic and religious minorities representations. Uh, more than that, uh, at least one in every four candidates on a party list must be a woman. But regardless of those legal prescriptions, uh, the reality is that although, as you know, we have a woman who became a president, uh, women have won just 21%, uh, 21 seats in this uh, parliament. And I think that uh, this, this is something, you know, which, uh, which has to be addressed, you know, more, more equality in gender representation. Uh, I would stop, I would stop, uh, I would uh, go on with uh, judiciary. And re the recent wave of uh, criticism when we speak about uh, sound Georgian judiciary uh, was caused by uh, the wave of appointments of judges to the Supreme Court. Uh, with your permission, I would not go into um, many details, you know, which are relevant to the process, but I would stop uh, on few, uh, uh, on, on, on few uh, the points both positive points and negative points. And the positive points uh, which have been recognized by international uh, bodies uh, are about electronic allocation of cases. It's about uh, setting up an office of independent inspector at the High Council of Justice for judicial matters. It's about improving disciplinary proceedings and liability norms. It's about publishing the minutes of the High Court of Justice and why I'm High, High Council of Justice and why I'm I'm speaking about High Council of Justice because when will when when I'll touch on the uh, downsides and 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 deficiencies of Georgian ju judiciary, those deficiencies primarily they relate to the High Council of Justice. Uh, yes, uh, the next uh, probably positive. Uh, the, the, the improvements uh, uh, on the Georgian in Georgian judiciary, increasing number of judges in the Supreme Court uh, uh, up to 28, because we have a heavy backlog of uh, cases, and that could help, you know, to some extent. But as I've said, you know, some challenges still remain, and those challenges that, shamefully enough, and uh, Dr. Vamlik has mentioned my legal background and practicing the, the law for more than 25 years. Shamefully enough, after April 2020, 
There is no access to court decisions electronically, although the law provides that decisions should be published and should be accessible by the wider audience. That's one point. The next point is uh, about low access to public information uh, in relation to the courts. Next point, it's about inconsisten inconsistency in, process in uh, processing statistics about judiciary. And those are all the points which have been uh, uh, mentioned by, uh, by uh, international observers, but also been uh, emphasized by Georgian non-governmental organizations. It is also about uh, the process of the secret voting at the High Council of Justice, which uh, presumably, presumably does not allow for merit-based appointments and elections. And obviously, obviously needs to be revisited as soon as possible. Uh, it has also been recommended that the majority of members of High Council of Justice be non-judges, which could ensure uh, impartiality of the voting process. And the last, uh, what we saw, uh, uh, as you remember, I mentioned uh, the last wave of appointments to, uh, to the Supreme Court, that the process became highly politicized. And the politics uh, consummated, you know, the gist of the process. Uh, it, it, it left very small room uh, for discussions on merits. Uh, and therefore, I think um, for the honesty of our discussions, and uh, as I've said, you know, my legal background also compels me to state, you know, that unless this situation would not change, you know, in terms of merit-based appointments, we would be still uh, relatively far away from having reliable, reliable judiciary. And when I'm speaking about judiciary, when I'm speaking about electoral system, uh, may I remind, you know, when I when, when we started about uh, stating getting closer to Europe, and when I said that uh, getting closer to Europe, it's about two prime objectives. It's about uh, reliable foreign policy and reliable domestic policy. We, Georgia, as a uh, soft power in the region, if there is uh, any uh, viable um, uh, toolkits whereby we have to position ourselves and we've been trying to position ourselves as a regional leader is reflected in this sound political system, you know, that is and will remain our business card, if you will, or geopolitical or geoeconomical card, you know, something which is not just for the benefit of the Georgian audience, but which could have a ripple effect on the region as well. So I, I therefore, I think that it's really very hard to overemphasize importance of judiciary. It's really very, uh, uh, the, it's, it, it's, it's hardly possible to overemphasize importance of sound elections. And um, I, I, I would rather stop, you know, uh, the one speaking about judicial and elections here, because I, I would be anticipating uh, questions from your side and would also try to respond to your questions um, in an open-minded manner. Uh, Dr. Bambling, I, I thought to say a few words about uh, uh, the uh, Georgian economy, as we, uh, we have a quite ambitious topic of 30 years uh, since we're gaining independence. So if I may have uh, five, seven minutes, uh, then I could say a few words. If not, we can skip to, we can jump to, uh, we can proceed to Q&A. What would you recommend, please? Well, I think, well, first of all, thank you so far for this very sort of wide and very interesting expose of, of topics and challenges. Um, I, think, uh, I think it could be good to open up for questions now and then we have this sort of a topic that we can return to and we can see sort of how, how it goes with, with questions. And I suggest that we, uh, we go to the Q&A session and uh, I will switch off the recording part as I said.